welcome all of you to Stories of Success, uh, the value of impact investing and strategic philanthropy. Um, we have a great program this evening, an informative discussion with a group of accomplished UCLA alumna and advisors who've been involved in businesses that focus on social good. Um, I'm a member of the Board of Women in Philanthropy at UCLA and a graduate of UCLA Law School. And um, I'm happy to introduce the folks this evening that will be talking to you. But first, um, this event is really a collaboration between Women in Philanthropy and UCLA Anderson School of Management Impact at Anderson Program. Women in Philanthropy at UCLA, for those of you who don't know what it is, is an engagement program that celebrates and inspires women's giving across the UCLA campus and fosters women's participation on campus boards and in volunteer leadership positions. We celebrated our 20th anniversary in 2014, and there are now over 2,200 members of Women in Philanthropy who support every possible area of the campus. This extraordinary group of women leaders also have roles on advisory leadership groups at UCLA and hold positions within the UCLA Foundation. With respect to tonight's program, even if you're at the earlier stages of your career, and no matter what the size of your portfolio, it is valuable to learn that you can make a positive impact through your investing as well as your philanthropy. Many people want to put their hard-earned capital into companies, organizations, and funds that generate social and environmental impact while providing a financial return. These socially responsible entities aim to uphold a mission to do well while doing good for society. Impact investing is an exciting and rapidly growing industry powered by investors who are determined to generate social and environmental impact as well as financial returns. A panel of experts connected to UCLA will discuss the importance and value of financially supporting investments that are meaningful as well as the benefits that making impact, impactful philanthropic contributions can have on your portfolio while also sustaining your principles. After the program, you'll have an opportunity to network with one another as alumni, business professionals, and philanthropists, and also to enjoy dessert. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Lisa Richter. Um, she's to my immediate left, and she's the managing partner and co-founder of Avivar Capital. Lisa, uh, it, the firm is an investment advisory firm focused on managing impact investment portfolios and developing impact-driven funds and families of funds on behalf of clients. Lisa co-leads Avivar's overall business activities, bringing over two decades of fund management and investing experience. Previously, she led GPS Capital Partners, a national consultancy that assisted foundations and other institutions to design and execute impact investing strategies. She has authored or co-authored several guides on impact investing, and she has assisted foundation, bank, government, and community-based clients to create or expand development financing initiatives in urban, rural, and tribal communities throughout the United States. She holds a BA and an MBA from the University of Chicago, and Lisa is an adjunct instructor co-teaching a graduate course on impact investing at that other school whose name we won't <laughs> mention that is across town in Los Angeles. Uh, she's clearly an expert in the field and we are very fortunate to have her leading our discussion this evening. Lisa. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. Yes, just consider me a UCLA wannabe. I think that would be the great summary of my bio. Um, and I just want to thank Women in Philanthropy at UCLA for holding this event and inviting all of us. And before I introduce the panelists, I just wondered if we could get a quick um, get to know you with the audience. So in many ways, the theme of philanthropy and impact investing is really one about how we align our activities, um, whether it's volunteering, whether it's choice of studies, whether it's work, whether it's what we purchase, whether it's how we invest with our values. And I just wondered how many of you 
currently do some kind of volunteering in alignment with your values? Show of hands. Great. Beautiful. Um, contributions, however minor or however large that might be. Great. How many people are studying for some kind of a business or finance degree and are thinking about bringing an impact lens to that work? Yay. <laughs> All right. How many people have chosen their profession in some ways to activate their, their values? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then finally, how many have in some way begun to think about or practice impact investing? Wonderful. I mean, I think we have a critical mass on <laughs> all fronts, yeah. and I'm really <laughs> excited to have this dialogue with you. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our, our panelists who are also deeply immersed in these issues, beginning with Marta Farrow, who is an Anderson MBA from 99 and currently president of Starfish Impact, um, a consulting firm I'm sure that you founded in 2005. Yes. Yeah, yes. great, wonderful. And a firm that makes a difference by providing strategic investment consulting services to grant making uh, private and corporate foundations, strategic planning and development consulting services to operating nonprofits, and social impact advisory services to corporations and individuals who strive to achieve a stronger double bottom line financial and social uh, vision. So look forward to hearing from Marta on a range of topics. Um, and then we also have Natalie Ricks, who is um, communications director for Swell Investing, a somewhat newer, founded in 20, uh, 2017, yeah. 2017 yeah. about a year old. <laughs> Um, platform for publicly traded securities um, with, where the goal of the company is to deliver profit as well as purpose, built on the belief that today's biggest challenges will result in tomorrow's leading industries. Thus, invest in those who are taking on problems and solving them, and you'll get a financial return as well as social impact. So um, with that intro to our great panelists, um, I'm going to begin by asking Natalie to just tell us how impact investing is different than traditional investing. Oh, sure. And I, I think that you mentioned this, but basically with uh, traditional investing, you're just worried about the financial bottom line. But with impact investing, we have that double bottom line that we are introducing. So you're looking for a financial return on your investment, but you're also looking for some kind of social good return. Um, and there are all different ways to measure that, but investors traditionally uh, in impact investments expect that they're going to get some kind of social or environmental uh, return in addition to in addition to making money. So. Tremendous. And you know, I've actually been involved in this field myself since the mid 1980s, and can give you the historical perspective that when the field first got started launched, by the way, in large part by women religious, along with some major foundations in the US, the Ford Foundation particularly. Um, the conventional wisdom at the time was that if you in any way limited your universe of possible investments, of necessity, uh, you were trading away your potential financial return. And uh, Natalie, I think today we view that quite differently. Um, what I understand is that including social and environmental criteria can help to manage risk. It could potentially also enhance return. What is the thinking uh, at Swell? Yeah, definitely. So we like to think about, uh, we like to think about in impact investing and socially responsible investing as a spectrum. So on one side of the spectrum, you have a negative screen. So you're screening away things like firearms or uh, casinos. And that was really what you're talking about with the religion, the earliest kind of impact investing. And then you have ESG, which is a lot of the funds that are available publicly for retail investors, and they screen for environmental, social, and governance. And the thinking is that the companies that are taking into, a, into account the environment and the workforce on a broader scale are planning long term. And so those are the companies that are going to outperform. So that's really good. That's a great thing that's happening for the retail investor. What we do at Swell is take that one step further, and we look at real impact investing through the capital markets. So we make sure that each company in our portfolios maps to a UN Sustainable Development Goal, so they're actually solving for a certain, uh, for a certain global challenge. So in, if you think about our clean water portfolio, there are companies in, there in the Internet of Things space, and they're, um, they're working with municipalities to find leaks and 
uh, insufficiencies in the water supply system. If you think in the future where California is going to be in 50 years, those are the companies that are really going to um, outperform. So that's how we think about impact investing to the capital markets. Tremendous. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, so you've, you've said you look for those problem solvers. Are there mm -hmm. other things that you particularly look for when you're trying to put together a portfolio? Yeah, actually. So, um, so the initial product was the six thematic portfolio. So it was um, clean water, uh, disease eradication, zero waste, renewable energy, uh, green tech, and healthy living. So that all of the companies in there fit within those portfolios. Now we're also thinking about um, making it a little, a little bit broader. So our next products are going to look at things like, do you have a minority or a woman on your board or in a leadership position? Those are really important things when it comes to impact. We also do uh, look at ESG, so environmental social governance. They have to pass um, our ESG screen, so we also look, look at that. But the thing that really makes us different um, when you look at other op options out there for the retail investor is just that derived revenue aspect of it. They have to make money by solving a challenge. Great. And one of the questions that, that came from the planning of the event is whether you find that most businesses put their intended impact first or their business first. What are you seeing in that regard? Yeah, definitely. So I think we're seeing a lot of um, established companies that are, that are seeing, okay, there's a, huge, uh, there's a huge opportunity here with how my brand is perceived. So much of how a company is going to perform over the long term is how that, is how that brand is perceived. So if you're looking at a consumer-facing company, a lot of them are looking at, okay, how can we be more socially responsible? You look at Adidas and they're launching a line of uh, sneakers from recycled uh, plastic that would have ended up in the ocean, things like that. And that, that creates a ton of positive goodwill and those companies are going to outperform um, over the long term. And then, but the other way that we think about it is that the, um, it's, it's not an either or proposition. It's really the companies that are solving challenges are going to, out, are going to outperform because those challenges aren't, aren't going away. So I think you're going to see kind of the rise, um, as you see the rise of impact investing, you're going to see the rise of social good companies. Then you're also going to see existing companies move towards more social good in their business plan. It's really a pressure that's emerging in the marketplace, uh, literally a market demand uh, for some kind of accountability and social responsibility. Um, I can't help but think as I say those words though that that could also become marketing hype. Mm -hmm. And how do you tease through and differentiate those that are really delivering versus those that might be marketing? Yeah, we talk a lot about greenwashing. So we have, um, <laughs> I know it's, um, so, and we have a, an impact team that is going, you know, getting on the earnings calls and uh, calling the sustainability uh, departments at the companies. If you get redirected to the marketing department when you ask about sustainability, that is a huge <laughs> red flag. <laughs> Not to say that doesn't happen. So it's just really about doing that due diligence of is this company, can it show through data? Um, you can't, can't fake data, you shouldn't be able to. <laughs> um, can you show through data that this company is actually solving a challenge? So that's kind of how, how we're looking at it. Okay, great. And just one more question to kind of frame impact investing before we hear from Marta on uh, philanthropy. Um, but sometimes I know that an investor can hold a stock where the investor may have objections to the policies or practices of that company. Um, and yet there may be reasons to continue to hold that stock, whether it's just um, incredibly costly to sell it all at once um, or other reasons. And sometimes the investor will choose to hold the stock because that's a way to influence the company. What do you do in those situations? If you're holding a stock, you, you'd like to sell it, but it doesn't make sense financially to sell it just all at once, or you want to uh, be inside the company to drive change. What are the tools? Definitely. So some people, so some people are impact investors and they just want to put their money with good companies. And then you have people who are more uh, they're more into shareholder advocacy, so they will. There are people who will hold portfolios of bad companies so that they can show up at the um, shareholder meetings and they can raise shareholder resolutions. So, um, an example of that is a coalition got together and McDonald's shareholders, and McDonald's has ninety million puts out ninety million plus uh, plastic straws per day in its entire supply chain. 
Um, that's, how, that's how much waste it puts into the environment. And the coalition uh, owns a piece of McDonald's, even though they are against McDonald's, and they, and they put up a shareholder resolution to try to get rid of plastic straws in McDonald's. So that's an example of if you want to be a, a really active in your investment and you want to drive change from within, that's another, that's another option. It just depends how much um, is this something that you can devote a lot of time and energy to, or is this something where you aren't as active with your investing and you want to just put it towards good companies, but that is another, uh, that is another option, um, and it's a really interesting one, and there's a huge opportunity to drive change, especially as we have um, a lot of people's money is tied up with the larger asset managers. You have people like Larry Fink who are coming out publicly and saying, it's not enough, but but you also. Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> BlackRock, the biggest asset manager, perhaps yeah. in the world. Yeah, six one trillion of dollars, yeah. and um, so you have so a lot of people's retirement money are tied up with these larger fund managers. And when you own a mutual fund or an ETF, you don't have a say in uh, in how necessarily um, in those shareholder resolutions. Um, so it's just all about how you know how active do you want to be, how much energy do you have to, do you want to um, put towards this? But there there's a lot being done as far as technology and bringing that voter that shareholder power back to um, the people that I think is going to really emerge over the next several years. Shareholder engagement, mm -hmm. shareholder advocacy; those are some of the buzzwords. Um, the term shareholder activism was the original term, but that's actually been co-opted by um, investors that are nowadays more focused on driving profits only. So I think when we hear the terms engagement and advocacy, uh, then we're talking more about the investors that want to use their shareholder positions to drive social change. And as you were saying, not only is technology emerging to support that activity, but there are also networks and coalitions mm -hmm. so that the individual shareholder can add their voice with others to really uh, drive change on a collective basis. I think the greatest maybe historical example would be those folks who voted shares and even divested of their shares in some cases to drive um, the dismantling of, of apartheid in South Africa way back in 86, but it's been used in other ways since. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. That brings us to philanthropy. Um, uh, and Marta, um, how do you differentiate what you do and lead and advise on as a philanthropic advisor compared to what we were just talking about in terms of impact investing? What's yeah. the similarity and then what's the difference? <coughs> right. Well, I think a key difference is that um, I also look at it as, as a continuum. So with um, investing for pure profit kind of at the far end of the continuum that you started talking about and with philanthropy on the other far end. And so um, a key difference is with philanthropic investing, you're not looking for a financial return or ROI. You're typ typically looking for a social return. Um, and with impact investing and, and every other, you know, um, sort of component of that continuum, you're looking for, you know, a market rate or better financial return, typically. So that's kind of a short answer of the difference. Great. Um, but I think, you know, similar to impact investing, um, there is a lot of sort of diversity and creativity in terms of how engaged um, an organization, a family, or an individual can get with their philanthropy, and that's what I think makes it so interesting. There's so many different ways of being philanthropic. So happy to get into that more through your questions or audience questions, but it's certainly why it's a very stimulating field for me and my team. You know, when you think about um, impact investors sort of bringing a values lens to their investing, um, I have a sense that your philanthropic practice brings more of an entrepreneurial lens or maybe a more strategic slash results oriented lens to the activities of nonprofits. Is that fair or how would you kind of describe that? Yes, I mean, I think it's both. So our firm works with three types of clients um, and certainly with all of them, um, philanthropists, so it could be families or individuals, companies that are typically um, doing something in corporate social responsibility, which people use the acronym CSR, um, and then also um, operating nonprofits. Um, I think the field has definitely just continued to elevate and move in a more strategic direction, and certainly entrepreneurial. I think more and more um, sort of tech entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs and business people are jumping into the field, both um, 
sort of in a staff leadership perspective as well as, um, as philanthropists. And then um, at the same time, I think just the values conversation is very important because I think similar to impact investors, um, when we work with um, philanthropists, we're starting with their values and, and then from there looking at, you know, what's your theory of change, which is essentially the change that you want to make in the world and, you know, that impact and, how, and then how are you evaluating and measuring it and sort of doing your best work um, and doing mission and vision work, et cetera. So to me, it all comes together. Yeah. And as you and I were discussing before the event, in that thinking through what are you trying to accomplish, um, how are you going about it, how are you measuring it, sometimes the question may come up, is the right tool that you need to accomplish your impact grant capital, or could you perhaps also use financial capital? Let's say you're a, a health clinic serving low-income populations and you need to expand your facility. Um, in, in the work that... Um, that Avivar does with uh, philanthropic clients, they're starting to use some of their uh, endowment dollars and in, on occasion their grant dollars as well to make financial investments on very flexible and affordable terms so that a nonprofit organization serving low income populations can get more money faster, a loan usually being much bigger than a grant, to drive their impact sooner. And, and so sometimes that sometimes there's a hybrid between philanthropy and investing, which would be investments made on concessionary terms to drive charitable impact. But uh, Marta, when we go back to thinking about strategic nonprofits, what are some of the guidelines you give to um, donors uh, on how they can identify a nonprofit that's really strategic? Absolutely. And before I answer that, I just wanted to add to your comment that um, you know, it's still, I'd say, an outlier, but um, larger, I'd say, philanthropists are starting to use LLCs or like a hybrid LLC nonprofit organization um, to give just because there's more flexibility and control, um, a little bit more privacy around, you know, tax returns, et cetera. You can be more entrepreneurial. Um, and so that's just something to mention in terms of, you know, it's not just foundations and donor advised funds and checkbook giving. Um, but I think, and that's predominantly been driven by tech entrepreneurs, but mm -hmm. other, others are using them as well. I'm happy to talk about that in more detail. Yeah. Um, but back to your Great. your other question. Yeah. Um, can you repeat it quickly? Or sure thing. How do you identify yeah. um, a strategic nonprofit or, or even help one to become more right. strategic? So, I mean, to me, um, our team really takes a business perspective to, you know, our work with, with all of our clients. And certainly, again, when thinking about investing into nonprofits as grantees, um, we look at it as, as if you're almost investing into a for, you know, the same way that you would um, do due diligence and look at a for-profit. So we're looking at the team and leadership, and we're looking at financials. Um, you know, there's a lot of public information available through their 990. Um, if you're engaged with them, you can ask them for other, you know, private financial information, which they're usually willing to share. Um, and I think it's looking at, um, again, if you can get access to it, their strategic plans, if they have one, even if they don't have a formal one, you know, um, programmatic data. Um, and if they do or don't have a plan, if they've created goals and they're tracking against that, it's really taking a look at um, lots of data, I would say. And, and somewhat similarly to a for-profit mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And your company has been enormously successful in helping nonprofit organizations attract grant resources. Um, what are some of the success elements in, in that work? What, how do the organizations have to change to be able to conduct a successful grant raising campaign? It's, um, it's definitely shifted. Um, we've been in business for 13 years and I've, I've seen the real difference. It's gotten harder. You know, we've come back from the recession, but that was certainly a tricky time um, when endowments were really hit significantly. But I would say that um, having some sort of relationship or connection is usually very important. It doesn't mean that you'll get the funding, but it just gets you um, on top of the pile or um, you know, noticed, so to speak. A, a lot of funders, you know, fund um, a low percentage of the number of applications or, or grant submissions that they get. 
So the relationship is key, and that could be, um, it's often best when it's through a board of director or trustee type of relationship with another trustee at the funder or possibly staff member program officer, but it can also be staff or consultant. Um, but from there, really, you have to have an incredibly strong mission fit, and your nonprofit has to have key impact. And it really, it's case by case with the funder, what type of impact they're looking for, size of organization, um, again, sort of the data and how it's evaluated. But I think more than ever, um, nonprofits really need to make a strong case for support and have data to back it up. Um, your leadership team, including your board, not just your staff, is very important and will be scrutinized as well. Um, Natalie talked about companies that solve the world's greatest problems. And often in the philanthropic arena, we hear about systems change, quote yes. unquote. Um, do you find that's something that the givers that you're supporting are looking for? And if so, how does a nonprofit make the case that they right. are really helping to drive systems change? It's making it tougher, I would say, for the smaller, more entrepreneurial nonprofits, and there are a lot of those, um, especially in the you know the Southern California market. Um, but I would say, like systems change and capacity building funding is very popular. Um, I think, luckily, a lot of the funders are aware of the fact that unrestricted and general operating support is really important to nonprofits. Um, the Real Cost Project is something that's gained a lot of traction in the last few years um, in terms of, again, funders getting more realistic and open to the grantees in terms of what does it really cost to run your programs and looking at them as an overall operation and not just the specific program costs. So um, I think um, it's just the more competitive you are, um, again, sort of in showing impact, um, you know, the, the better off you are. But unfortunately, I think if there's a systems change funder and you're not doing systems change work, then you're probably not going to win that funding. Uh -huh. So, yeah. And do you find that the, the appetite for data is usually in so-called outputs, measurable units like affordable housing produced, homelessness people, ha homeless individuals housed, or, or is there um, an outcome or a story that um, is more compelling? Or how are those balanced? I mean, if, if I had to choose, um, I haven't, I don't know the exact data around the preference, but I think it is more outcomes oriented. Not that outputs aren't important, but I just think that's the way philanthropy is, is going, and it's the way that the smarter and stronger and more sophisticated nonprofits are presenting themselves and the, and the types of data that the funders are looking for is a little bit more skewed in that direction. And that's, of course, often more costly right. to to create a narrative and a story and support it with enough data to make it credible. Well, it's a more long-term, yeah. I would yeah. say, um, set of data in a way that you're gathering. And it certainly can be more complicated yeah. um, to share that, you know, gather and share and analyze that information. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, when we think about giving guidance to a group like this audience, what would be some of the most important things um, that each of you might share? And I'll start with Natalie mm -hmm. on how to find companies to invest in or funds that drive social impact. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, there is more and more great uh, products out there. I think that the two most important things are to understand the strategy. So how is the investment company that you're considering finding those companies? Do they have uh, and you can go just read and understand their investment thesis. And the other thing is that there's just, there's really no substitute for going and understanding those companies, actually looking at the companies and understanding why they're in there, understanding if they're companies that uh, align with your values, are they the kinds of things you want to invest in. Um, there's, as we mentioned, there's a lot of greenwashing out there. And so uh, if you, but if you do enough research, you'll see, you'll, um, oil and gas names and casino names, you know, they might be um, doing a lot in terms of helping the environment and managing resources well, but it's still, is that essential business something that you want your, um, your dollars to back? So there's really just no, um, there's really no substitute for just doing the homework 
um, going to your, if you work with a financial advisor, going to them and asking them to walk you through the strategies and why they chose them and just go a little bit deeper. And the more that everybody just asks questions, the better the product will get because it starts with the people, it starts with the, the demand that's out there. So. Great. Well, <clears throat> you kind of mentioned the fact that one of the first steps might be just for the individual or the family or the institution to say, what are our own values? And um, is there a way that we can project those through our investing activity? And then does that end up maybe being a fund? Does it end up, end up being looking for individual companies or some combination? And the, and the other issue, I think, about finding a financial advisor that can help you is one that I know I've heard about a lot, that, that some investors um, either will sort of reject the idea of impact investing or socially, uh, social investing. Uh, you know, there's so many different names that might be used. Um, uh, sustainable and responsible impact investing, that's what SRI stands for today. Um, originally it meant something else, but sustainable and responsible <laughs> impact investing. Uh, environmental, social, and governance, or ESG investing. But some investment advisors will not be comfortable engaging in that conversation. And I think if you should encounter that, you should certainly give yourself permission to have some conversations with others to find out who some of your friends might be using, et cetera, because there are also uh, extraordinarily thoughtful and experienced and competent financial advisors um, in this field. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then kind of seeing what's possible. Um, for, for you, um, uh, how, would you, how would you suggest somebody get started on finding the right philanthropic partnerships, um, Marta? Yeah, I think so taking aside like doing strategic planning and kind of getting started that way and looking more at the research component of it, um, I mean, literally you could start with Google or you know, there are a lot of databases out there as well and organizations that um, have really organized all of the nonprofit options, whether it's geographically or by size or cause area. Um, so in today's world, all that information is pretty re readily available. Um, and I think, but I still think it is starting with um, narrowing down what you're interested in. And then I think similar to what you've both said is that the exact same way that you would use a financial advisor for impact investing, you would use a philanthropic advisor for your philanthropic investing. So, you know, in both cases, you can go it on your own. But if you really want to work with an experienced um, expert and have more guidance and hand holding through it, um, I think you can, you know, also dig into the process that way. Um, and I think it is thinking about too, like what is the purpose of your philanthropy? Um, how much are you giving away? Um, a, a lot of different components so that, um, you know, some people want to be more engaged. They want to join boards, um, be a little bit more hands-on. And so I just think it's thinking through all of that. And again, um, sort of geography, size of organization. Are you getting a larger family group involved? Is next-gen philanthropy important? So I don't think that there's one way to go at it, but there's certainly that research component and due diligence component. Yeah, tremendous. Any comments about um, associations that people can go to that, that network peers who are thinking about philanthropy? I know yeah. that's really helpful in impact investment. Right, absolutely. I mean, um, locally, if you have a foundation, whether it's corporate or, or private, um, Southern California Grantmakers is a great organization, and I'm, I'm part of that as well, and it's been a great resource for me and my clients. Um, there are organizations like AIP that gather both the nonprofits and the philanthropists in one room. And just a side comment that a lot of these organizations have a no solicitation rule, so it's really kind of creating a safe space for dialogue and sharing. Um, and then there are some equivalent organizations in other markets, and there's you know, Council on Foundations and a number of national groups. Um, Exponent Philanthropy is great. Um, GEO is another good organization. So um, again, you can get really local or get sort of you know, national and global with it. And I love um, just you know, giving people resources and letting them run with it. Um, so anyone who has questions really about anything, whether it's about the type of vehicle and entity you're choosing, um, you know, the continuum of, around impact investing, 
um, joining different organizations, maybe articles and books that you should read to get up to speed. I'm happy to share resources. Tremendous. Now, what we've observed at Avivar is that it is often from philanthropy that individuals and families move into impact mm -hmm. investing. You know, they're thinking to themselves, I'm, I'm giving away money because I care so much about something like, let's say, environmental sustainability. Well, then I don't want to necessarily own stocks in companies that might be polluting the environment. And so that leads to this desire to create more um, alignment across one's holdings. Um, there is also, though, potentially the risk that um, people might begin to think that they could use investing instead of philanthropy to drive social change or to unlock opportunity. Um, I wonder if each of you have any thoughts about that and, and how we as a society should manage that risk. Natalie? Yeah. Yeah, I do have some thoughts about that. I'm also, in addition to my work with Swell, I'm really involved in the International Rescue Committee uh, Young Leaders Board in LA. Um, and what I, the way that I think about it is that they'll always both exist. And the reason for that is that there are just so many heartbreaking crises out there where immediate capital is needed to solve real human problems. And then what I think impact investing does is build the backbone that can eventually solve those challenges over the long term through through business. So in the ideal world, you would have both. You would have philanthropy that would come in and take care of those take care of those immediate challenges, and then and then business would solve um, their problems over the long term. Interesting perspective. And Marta, I'm going to guess that your perspective is going to be slightly different, but complementary. Yes, and remind me of the question again. It, it, I was so it totally was, focused on her. Yeah, answer. that was a that was yes. a fascinating response. The question was: Is there a risk that um, some socially motivated right. individuals and institutions will begin to think that their investing can substitute for right. philanthropic giving? Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a big risk, and I think what's great about it is the alignment and just getting potentially more aligned. And one, um, I think, sort of kernel of truth that struck me significantly when I first heard it is really, for example, a foundation is really, you know, 95% of a foundation's capital is being invested. So it's really an investment vehicle that's, you know, typically throwing off 5% a year. And I think that's a pretty um, significant fact to just consider, that if you're investing 95% in a way that doesn't align with your values and mission, there, you know, that's something to take a look at. So I think um, a lot of advisors work together, and I think um, as clients are looking to come more together with both sides of their giving, if you, you know, want to call it that, or investments, and advisors are working together that we can just do a better job in this continuum yeah. field, if you will. So I think the best sort of um, investors and advisors don't look at it as a threat. They're looking at the interconnectivity of it and the intersection of it and um, coming together. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, and as I consider what each of you have said over the course of the evening, um, Natalie, starting with your last comment about philanthropy being that, that quick resource that can respond to an immediate issue, um, uh, I think that that's um, very powerful. Um, what I've often seen in strategic philanthropy is the idea of moving away from just responsiveness right. to also starting to drive some more sustainable change. Exactly. And then where investing starts to come in is helping to sustain and scale that change as we see promising models, whether it's nonprofit organizations um, that, uh, that, that have some kind of a revenue source that uh, allows them to take on financial capital and repay it. Uh, that's really one of the critical differences that we've seen between philanthropy and investing or, uh, or for-profit businesses that are, are trying to provide a product or a process or service that drives a social good. Um, like many of you may know of the California-based company called Revolution Foods that started up maybe five, ten years ago to create healthy meals for uh, public schools, K-12 district schools serving low-income children who wouldn't necessarily otherwise have access to healthy food. And for low-income children, they consume a huge amount of their calories in public school. So that was a for-profit company trying to pr provide a social good. Um, and, and it was earning revenue. 
by selling that product to the school district. And the fact that it was earning revenue would allow it to retain investment. Similarly, a nonprofit organization that has a diversified revenue stream, and I suspect you do a fair amount of right. work on helping nonprofits generate uh, revenue streams like a clinic that gets reimbursement for seeing patients or like an affordable housing developer that takes in subsidy resources, those entities can take on either loans or investments and repay them, enabling them to sustain their operations and to scale their operations. So we've got the responsive philanthropy, we've got the strategic philanthropy right. driving change, we've got the impact investments helping to sustain and scale the change, and then we've got through the kinds of activities that Swell's doing, uh, really selecting and reinforcing those publicly traded companies, large corporations um, that are taking on global problems. And that can help us bring all of our holdings into alignment. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, I would just agree, like whether it's the larger philanthropists that are using LLCs or fa large family foundations, that they're often making you know, similar impact as um, you know, a for-profit um, company that an impact investor might invest in. Mm -hmm. It's just you're not getting a financial return if you're doing it through a nonprofit vehicle. But if you're doing it through the LLC vehicle, it really, I think it just kind of collapses the industry a bit more and connects it where you're being highly philanthropic but through impact investing. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we would love to open it up for your questions, comments, thoughts. Anything that was a surprise? Yes. Great. And we've talked about it in our investment about um, that balance between doing some sort of traditional investing, which we, we've chosen a, a passive investment strategy, which means that we do have small investments in things that we would not find socially acceptable. And then impact investing, and I think one of the things, and we didn't do a deep dive into the research, but one of the things that we found is that it can be more of a marketing um, angle for um, funds, especially publicly traded companies, yeah. uh, especially, uh, you know, like a mutual fund where it's more of a marketing, and it's like how deep a dive do you take in order to make sure that you're really you know, not that you're not using child labor, that you're, you know, really recycling. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's lots of books and lots of, of talk about it, but I mean, what's the practical, um, what's the practical implementation? And then from a, a fiduciary standpoint of, a, of, you know, managing an endowment, what happens if you don't meet, you know, market returns, mm -hmm. then what, you know, can, you know, are you, are you really doing right by your organization? So, it's been a really big tension that we've been talking about, and I don't know exactly, you know, what Swell is doing or other companies are doing, and how far do you go in each of those areas to, to determine that? So mm -hmm. I would love to ask Natalie to give us some mm -hmm. thoughts on that. Um, before I um, do, maybe I'll just say a word about the fact that the regulations over the years um, that inform fiduciary responsibility have been evolving. So um, the IRS in 2015 put out new guidance that said that a, a mission-driven organization uh, need not always seek a profit-maximizing investment in every case, provided that they are making investment decisions based on what can advance their mission, and they just need to document that. And of course, we know that um, under fiduciary responsibility, you, uh, you can be held accountable for so-called jeopardizing investments, but I think those are seen as really being capricious or reckless, whereas if there is a decision to, um, from time to time, accept um, a less than profit maximizing opportunity that's better aligned with mission, I think that that is increasingly seen as very consistent with fiduciary responsibility. Um, to go in deeper into your question, which I think really is at the crux of the matter of how we examine investment opportunities and decide sort of where to draw the line in terms of what's acceptable and isn't, would love to hear some of your thoughts, Natalie. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, and there, yeah, there is a lot of, lot of marketing language out there. Um, I think it's just knowing what the, whatever 
uh, investment you are vetting, knowing what their North Star is. So for our, our North Star is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Like we, that's the future, and that's 193 world leaders uh, sign those um, into existence. And, um, and then also the big key for us is that the companies have to derive revenue. There's really not another retail platform where they have that rule. We have a rules-based system. Um, so if you look at that, uh, the company has to derive revenue from the UN Sustainable Development Goal. Does that mean that there are not utilities that have a portion in oil and gas in our portfolios? Um, they certainly are in there because most of what they're using are renewables. Uh, something with, with what we'd look for with that is do they have momentum in their business plan? Are they moving more towards renewables? They might be here now, but in the future, are they, are they going to be over here? So. It's really just making sure that there's a team in place, there's a really good rule set, that rule set is um, transparent to the people who are vetting it. Um, and then also understanding for everyone involved that there's, there's nuance to all of these things and it's, it's, very, uh, it's very tricky, um, <laughs> for sure, yeah. Great answer. Um, you know, there are entire companies set up that research the social performance mm -hmm. of companies nowadays, and they, they, I think they do a great job. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of information available, and here again is a situation where you're going to want to find um, an investment advisor that's willing to look at all those things and help you make those decisions. Well, one thing kind of um, implied in Natalie's answer, a word that I sometimes use that she didn't quite throw, throw out, that I hear, is materiality. So if, 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 you know, if somebody's got a tiny fraction of their business that's involved in something objectionable, maybe you can live with that. Whereas I, I really love the emphasis there on momentum, are you, and are you earning revenue from the problem solving, which is, which are really, um, I, I think that's a great window on how the field is changing. It's moving away from excluding things that are negative and finding things that are positive to drive change. Uh, other thoughts or questions? Yes, please. Oh, what a great question. Marta, would you like to lead up? Because Marta's career path has been so epic that had I given a full biography, we would have taken up the whole evening. <laughs> That's very sweet of you. Um, so the short version is, um, you know, went to progressive school when I was younger and then a Quaker high school, Sidwell Friends, and started a nonprofit in high school with a group of peers. And so just really from my family's background, my father ran um, the Children's Bureau, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and my mother's work as well. It's just kind of in my DNA. But I always did it as a volunteer. And so what I found was that um, in my late 20s and early 30s in particular, I was spending 30 hours a week um, kind of pro bono consulting, running nonprofits, chairing boards, fundraising, chairing fundraising committees, and then doing my career, which was easily, you know, 40, but 40 plus hours a week. For four years, I was in China for two weeks out of every month, and I worked for Goldman Sachs before that. And so I think I just got to a point where I realized I could marry my business skill set with my passion and interest in philanthropy and nonprofit. And I really, I didn't really want a job in the industry. I didn't really want to be a development director or an executive director from, for one organization. It felt um, just kind of innately, I, it almost grew over time, like the realization that I made the choice around consulting. I never hung a consulting shingle as a um, stopover between jobs. It was very purposeful. And from day one, have really enjoyed the variety of the work and also that we're learning from every client. And then um, everything's very confidential, but kind of applying those learnings forward and really at the same time. So at this point, we work with about 10 to 15 different clients at any given time, and we're doing a lot of strategic planning engagements, but also a lot of execution work. And even when we're working with philanthropists and also operating nonprofits, we're able to um, you know, just kind of learn from all of that and not necessarily do a ton of matchmaking, but um, out, almost outside of our client base, we do a lot of connecting. So if we're working with um, nonprofit clients, we're connecting with as many resources as possible that can be helpful and vice versa. So it's not always within that same smaller pool, but in the greater you know, Southern California community and beyond. So, um, And I went to Anderson Business School, I have to say that. And Alex, one of my section mates, um, is here as well. But um, 
for me, that was a real, a, a pivotal point in terms of the business side and opened a lot of doors and ideas to me there. And a lot of my team has advanced degrees and if not in business, in law or other fields. So we take a very holistic approach to our work. Mm, nice. My uh, career is far less epic. <laughs> um, but I, so before I found Swell, I, I lived in New York for eight years, um, and I was doing public relations and marketing for some of the largest asset managers in the world, Charles Schwab, um, Northwestern Mutual, J.P. Morgan type of thing. Amazing, uh, large companies had in, incredible programs to work on. Um, and then, but in my private time, I was living in Brooklyn, wearing, you, you know, um, upcycled clothing, riding my bike around, <laughs> going to the uh -huh. farmer's market. And it felt just like these worlds, uh, who, I, who I was on the weekend and who I was at, at work, um, weren't completely connected. So uh, I moved to Los Angeles and I didn't really know exactly where my career was headed. Went to an event at Swell a month after they launched and talked to Dave, who was an Anderson alum. And the rest is history. Um, they, needed, they needed help kind of um, telling the story. And so I was able to help them with that. And that, I joined full time last August. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'll back into my career path because I do want to mention that I'm here in place of my um, Aviva co-founder, Tina Castro, who is an Anderson grad, 2005. Um, and um, going forward from tonight, let us make Los Angeles the next epicenter of impact <laughs> investing and strategic philanthropy um, with, with Anderson at the heartbeat. That, that will work for, for me. Uh, but um, I actually uh, grew up in Chicago, and as you heard, I, my degree is from the University of Chicago, and I grew up in the University of Chicago neighborhood, uh, which if you've studied um, any history of Chicago, you know that's right next to Woodlawn, and it's very similar to some of the very distressed neighborhoods that we're hearing about in Chicago nowadays. Um, and um, just uh, I'll just say that my family did not leave the inner city with the white flight that was happening uh, around us. We stayed there. And you would see streets and streets of boarded up buildings. And I think we asked ourselves at the dinner table, why was this so? Um, uh, and I think the DNA and the values that get uh, passed down through family or other important influences are really critical. And um, I, I think I was just off, began to ask myself the question of, uh, how, what was the behind, and without putting into words, how was the invisible hand working such that beautiful buildings in Chicago were boarded up? Oh, and by the way, those people happen to be African American. And so I could just see systemic barriers in access to opportunity, um, uh, and in some cases, to ca access to capital. Um, and I'll just say, uh, you know, very quickly, I was a music teacher, and my students could not afford to buy instruments. My parents didn't have time from the multiple jobs to help their kids practice, et cetera. And I thought to myself, you know, um, there are probably millions of people in this country that are praying for peace, and their resources are getting sucked into things that, you know, they may not really uh, favor. At that time, it was the development of Star Wars, which, you know, was taking money out of the Pell Grants of my students. So I, I, I thought, I'm going to get in the business of studying what investments support. And then maybe I can help people align their investments with their, um, well, as I would put it, their creeds with their cash. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, it, I saw an ad in the Progressive newspaper for a workshop on social investing. And this was 1984. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's amazing. This already exists. And it was being uh, hosted in Chicago by an organization called South Shore Bank, which many of you who are students of social investing have probably read about, uh, came to be called Shore Bank. Uh, and, and that was one of the earliest examples of a social enterprise. That was a visionary company created by uh, some individuals who believed that if you created a company and raised capital, and the purpose of that company, the way to derive profits was to drive social change then you could have more sustainable and scaled social change. And they ran a very successful commercial bank for several decades. Um, and uh, so I, I went to the workshop. Uh, I very shortly um, applied for business school at the University of Chicago and applied for a job at South Shore Bank and started them both the same week um, and, and just continued to stay in the field. And I must say 
that this field has evolved since I entered in 1986 uh, at a pace that I wouldn't have dared to imagine because, again, the original thinking was that this was kind of the granola fringe that you would incorporate social and environmental factors into investing. But I would argue that today you cannot find a mainstream uh, uh, Wall Street bank that doesn't have a marquee about impact investing. And in the analysis of investment practice, I think we see increasingly that, this, that incorporating social and environmental factors are seen as prudent risk management and even more and more possibly as a source of what's called alpha or premium returns. I don't think anyone on this panel would say this is a silver bullet. I think it, um, as with any of the practices we have here, um, investing, philanthropy, uh, finding those right opportunities, uh, structuring them, and then monitoring them to be sure that they do fulfill the intended social and financial goals is really critical. But I think what we have today is a, a vastly <coughs> larger opportunity set than in previous decades for, for unlocking opportunity, solving problems, and it's wonderful to have the opportunity to discuss that with all of you. Great. Just one more uh, okay, oh, I on. saw one in back here. Great. Hi, sorry. Thank you, ladies. I apologize for being late, but I'll just say since Anderson's been met, it's one too many events going on tonight, which is where I'm <laughs> coming from. But and you may have already touched upon this, and I think you have, but if with time of the essence here, if you had that 30 second elevator pitch to give, because oftentimes, even with philanthropy and success of business, the two don't collide. People still off, or at least in my experience from what I've heard, especially with others that I work with and especially women that I work with, the idea of success, especially financially, doesn't collide with that word philanthropy or social impacting and so forth. So if you had that 30 second elevator pitch to give for myself or to others to say, still making that passion a focus and that stride of success can come in all aspects, especially being the fulfillment from within and also making the living on the out. What would you say to that person? Hmm. The question is if you had 30 seconds to Yeah, that elevator. basic elevator. Oh, that I happens mean, to me all the time, mostly in my lift rides. In the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I would say this, that it's a, a, an impact investing platform, right? Sometimes uh, compare it to a betterment or something like that. Um, and I'll just say that all of the companies, uh, we have six portfolios and each of them maps the UN Sustainable Development Goals and then each of the companies within them derives revenue from one of those UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the idea is that over the long term, those goals um, and those, those are our great, represent our greatest challenges in the world. So the companies that are solving them are set to outperform. So you immediately have to get to the fact that there's purpose and profit because there's still a huge misconception that we deal with every day that you can't have that you can't have both, and you really can. It's good business. So. Great, Martha. Did you want to add something on that? Um, I think, in the essence of time, I won't. But I just think, you know, around so many issues, there, you know, the 21st century, I think, has just brought us um, to that nexus point. And it's similar with education and all different topics. Where I think now is the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And I might reinforce what Natalie said with an expression we often hear, which is both and. Yeah. Um, we really don't have to trade away. It's not a silver bullet. You have to bring the strategic analysis that I think you've heard from all the panelists. But these opportunities are there. And they're there as giving and investing and certainly as livelihoods. Great. I'd also like to thank our colleague, Bob Nassivanon, Executive Director of Impact at Anderson for Social Impact and Innovation at UCLA Anderson School of Management for her advice and assistance and support. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Melissa Efron Hayek and Betty Montano for putting together this event and putting it on and doing such a terrific job. Um, this is the last Women in Philanthropy program for um, the school year, but you can look forward to an informative event in the fall. So please check our website to see what's, what's next. And I hope you all will join us, um, continue mingling and networking, and have some dessert afterwards. Mm -hmm.
So thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys.